Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the ASHES PDC conference and this virtual panel discussion. The Pandemic's Other Frontline, How Lab Design and Operations Can Future-Proof the Workplace and Beyond. I'm Lindsay Connor, Marketing Manager for McCarthy Building Companies, the ninth largest domestic contractor in uh, the U.S. McCarthy specializes in building complex and precise environments for our clients across the nation. From hospitals to state-of-the-art research facilities and advanced manufacturing buildings, I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for today's program. If you have any questions throughout the discussion, please type them into the chat and we will try to get to as many as possible following this discussion. You may also reach out to me directly and I'll make sure that questions are answered. My email is lconnor at mccarthy.com. We're all here today to talk with the experts about how lessons learned in building contagion-free laboratories translates to transforming the healthcare facilities of the future. We hope that through today's discussion, you will learn valuable information about how the state-of-the-art lab and research facilities designed and built to protect the safety and health of their employees serve as an example for best practices that can be implemented in almost any environment to protect your employees, patients, and visitors. We believe that at the end of this discussion, you will have gained a new perspective on how to advance design and construction practices that can ensure workplace security and safety. Now to introduce our panel of esteemed experts. Um, we have Kate Heyer. She is Principal Architect and Lab Planner at the Clark Anderson Partners. Um, Kate has a specialization in higher education, science technology, and healthcare education facilities. She has led design on numerous high-profile projects at universities, research parks, and medical education centers across the nation. And as a leader of the firm's science and technology team, her focus lies at the intersection of process, visioning for the future, and design excellence. Thank you, Kate. Um, next, we have Myron Gonzalez. He is the director of the Kansas Health and Environmental Laboratories for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. As director of laboratories with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, he oversees all aspects of state public health and environmental laboratories, as well as certification programs, and has experience in a variety of roles within commercial laboratories. Myron has over 30 years of laboratory and management experience and represents Kansas in the NELAC, which is the National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Institute, and the Association for Public Health Laboratories. And finally, we have Seth Kelso. He is project director for McCarthy Building Companies, um, specializing in constructing high performance research in public health labs for McCarthy. Uh, Seth has overseen construction of more than 25% of the nation's biosafety level four laboratories um, and high containment facilities, which are used to conduct research related to infectious diseases, biological agents, and other sensitive scientific and medical areas. Seth is currently leading the construction for the National Bio Agro Defense Facility in Manhattan, Kansas, as well as the CDC's Building 28 on the Roy Ball campus in Atlanta. So, um, Thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be here today. And um, I guess we will get started. And the first question is, um, in many ways, research labs have also been on the front line of this pandemic. Um, could each of you share how organizations like yours responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? And Myron, I'll let you kick this off. Sure, thank you, Lindsay. It's good to be here today. So as uh, for the state of Kansas, we only have one state public health lab and as the state uh, lab, we were responsible for being uh, able to test uh, COVID-19 uh, for our citizens. Uh, we were one of the first labs to validate the CDC assay back in late February. Um, and we maintain, we always maintain a certain readiness to handle emerging diseases. So initially we rolled out uh, this project, this emerging disease is COVID into our routine work with around 50 to 100 samples a week. Um, by mid-March, we were at 300 a day. Uh, that went up to 1,000 a day, then three to 5,000 a day throughout the summer into the fall. And in late fall, we increased our capacity to 7,500 samples per day. Um, and that is in a state public health laboratory. Um, cross training was a critical component of that. Um, our staffing went from 65 to 110, even though, but in the early days, cross training was the only way to get that done because as you know, it's you can't uh, hire people immediately, you know, sometimes. So, uh, this the this expansion, this rapid growth that required uh, the use of multiple platforms. We had to increase our vendor relationships to be able to always be able to test. We uh, got very flexible with finding uh, finding products, finding supplies, finding the tools we needed. Um, and I'm happy to say we never lost a day of being able to test somebody. 
uh, for sampling. We never had to stop testing. Um, obviously, this required us to find ways to expand space wise to go that many samples could not fit into our normal spaces. Uh, in addition to finding uh, the ways to keep the people that were working safe and socially distanced um, because you know you lab work, you can't do it all. You can't do it remotely. You got to be here. Um, so uh, we converted two storage areas and a large training room to create a linear flow uh, COVID testing unit. And then most recently, and that uh, really helped us a lot. And then most recently, we worked with MRI Global uh, and some local uh, teams to uh, develop two mobile testing units, uh, testing labs actually that can go out into the community, especially in Kansas, very remote and some poorly served areas uh, and people who can't get to testing. Uh, so we're able to get there. We can drive in with a, a truck that's similar to a uh, well, it's really a, an old food truck kind of a concept. We can pull in, we can do testing and get same results, uh, day, same day results right there on the spot. Um, that's been really helpful. We may be, uh, may have been one of the first states to come up with the ability to actually be mobile within the same day multiple times. Um, and that's, that's really some of the ways we've uh, managed to uh, keep things moving here in Kansas. That's great. I think that the mobile test facilities are just really an innovative and interesting way that um, KDHE is supported during this pandemic. Um, Kate? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Well, um, the firm that I work at, Clark and Anderson, had the opportunity to work with Myron and his team on a study for Kansas Department of uh, Health and Environment. Um, I think we've completed our work. Myron, correct me if I'm wrong, um, in January of 2020, right before COVID um, exactly. began. And so it was kind of an interesting timing, but um, you know, lab facilities in general are set up for success as safe work environments, as long as they're complying with, you know, unidirectional airflow, once through air, you know, clean and dirty paths of travel for people, substances, instruments, those are all ideals, of course. I think typically also in research and testing labs, um, people are spaced out to a greater degree, um, which does help with social distancing. Um, all that being said, there are additional measures that can be taken, um, like additional PPE, um, the installation of plexiglass separators, which we have done for both research and teaching labs, um, reduced occupancies um, or staggered, um, I guess, um, work work times in the labs. And then also, of course, increased sanitizing, um, which also works very effectively in labs because of the high, um, the high level of finish. Um, I do want to highlight another facility that we designed um, that played a key role in the early days of the pandemic of the pandemic in the United States. Um, it's located at a research institution, uh, one of the healthcare education facilities at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, it houses within it the National Training, uh, Simulation, and Quarantine Center. It opened in late 2019. Um, so this facility contains the nation's only federal quarantine unit, um, a 20-bed facility. It also includes in it a training and simulation center for biopreparedness. Um, almost immediately after opening in early 2020, um, that facility it made headlines um, as the location to which the very first COVID patients in the U.S. Um, from the cruise ships were brought onto U.S. soil and contained in this facility in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, for a facility like this one, some of the primary considerations for design would really kind of center around, um, I would say there's a lot of airflow considerations. Um, every quarantine unit, um, of which there were 20, was negative air pressure to the spaces around it, of course. Um, the entire floor had a dedicated air handling unit. Um, it, it utilized um, high plume exhaust fans, um, HEPA filtration of exhaust air. Um, interestingly enough, uh, research and healthcare experts that we've worked with um, have actually recommended that, yeah, this is a little bit too much information, but kind of interesting that dealing with toilet waste for um, any patient that would happen, that would be in that quarantine unit, you would simply procedurally flush bleach down that toilet. So kind of an interesting, uh, you're going from high, very high tech air systems to something a little bit more manual and procedural when it comes to something like plumbing. Um, of course, no operable windows, um, you know, designated PPE donning and doffing locations. Um, the facility at UNMC actually did have a centralized command center um, in the event that a, that a situation, a disaster situation would occur. Um, people in that facility could coordinate with federal authorities um, throughout the U.S. Um, but the design of spaces like this one, it really underscore the importance of research and containment facilities that are, you know, just ready to go in the face of a worldwide catastrophe like the one we've experienced this past year through COVID. Seth, do you have any... Uh... Anything you'd like to add? Well, sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Lindsay, for for having me and uh, uh, Kate and Myron. Uh, glad to be on this panel with you guys. 
Um, you know, labs are very much on the front line of this pandemic, have been for well over a year, you know, trying to figure out what, what this virus is and ultimately how to, how to get a vaccine for it. So hats off to, to all the laboratorians and researchers and scientists across the world working on that. And also thanks to all the healthcare workers that uh, kept everybody safe. You know, I, I saw this firsthand with uh, bio, biosafety level four, BSL four laboratories that I'm currently overseeing for owners like the Center for Disease Control and the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, biosafety level four projects are unique because they contain life-threatening viruses and diseases where there's no known cure. These facilities have to be designed and constructed at the highest uh, standards of design, engineering, and quality and redundancy to ensure that the researchers can, can carry out their mission while they're inside the laboratory working with these highly contagion, life, you know, life-threatening viruses and maintaining their safety and also keeping the communities around the laboratory safe as well. So there's a lot of time spent uh, making sure these these facilities are safe for the for the researchers. Construction since construction industry was deemed essential, was critical for us to continue to advance on our design and construction of these facilities because they played a vital role in ensuring the health of everyone throughout the world. Health and safety is a top priority of McCarthy. So we put in uh, various procedures to ensure that, you know, our workers could come to work to help build these facilities and also the, the design teams could continue to collaborate and work together. So some of these, like on the project sites, we would, you know, simple things like increasing restrooms, increasing break areas, maintaining that social distancing, mandatory uh, face coverings, daily health screenings, you know, a lot of simple things that I think, you know, prior to the pandemic, you take for granted, you know, it's just a cough or whatever, now kind of, you know, uh, more than a year into it saying, man, maybe, maybe we should stay home and not, not come, come to work. So really, really good uh, processes and procedures now in place that allowed us to, to continue working on this. W one, one unique thing that, that we did that really, that we've always done is offsite prefabrication that helps with, with reducing the number of workers on site, which is really good for when you're trying to, you know, be more socially distant. So we kind of ramped up our efforts as, as it relates to prefabrication uh, to reduce the number of people interacting on the job sites. As an essential business uh, that has safely and successfully operated uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, McCarthy has identified five key behaviors and philosophies that uh, has allowed us to work through this pandemic and, and might work for you if you're getting ready in your place of business to, to get back to work, to bring workers back, to open things up for visitors. So the first one is communication. Second one is make it easy. Third is embrace technology. Fourth is lead by example. And fifth is be flexible and patient. I won't get into the specifics on all those, but I'll just touch on a couple. Communication is key, right? I mean, before uh, COVID, right, you would uh, socialize, you know, in the break area or when you're getting a cup of coffee. That really doesn't happen as much anymore, right? You know, you used to get your um, communication, your information different ways. So, you know, as, as, as leaders that are leading an office, you need to be deliberate in your communication. Make sure that you're communicating what the expectations are, what the new rules are. So over communication, you know, on one of our projects uh, throughout 20, we, we updated and published and communicated our uh, COVID uh, safety protocol more than a dozen times. And obviously a lot of, lot of changes happened uh, throughout uh, last year and it was key for us to communicate to everybody. Uh, Embrace technology, which was the third one I mentioned, uh, kind of a neat story there. We had a project superintendent uh, that was six months pregnant uh, last summer and uh, from advisement of her doctors, like, can you perform your work from home? As a, as a project superintendent, really, you really need to be at the office. So we used uh, technology uh, by, by having a video conference. She was able to work with a commission agent to walk down the commissioning checklist by being at home, but then, you know, b being there virtually uh, through a video conference. So again, just embracing technology is another key behavior to help, you know, get things back to more normal. 
That's great. Um, and of course, we have all five of the um, items that Seth listed in detail. If anyone's interested in learning more about those, please feel free to reach out and um, we will move on to our next question, which is how have your organizations been able to translate the design elements and procedures meant to keep researchers safe in controlled environments into non-lab spaces in your facilities? And Byron? Yeah, Go sure. Ahead. Well, you know, uh, as scientists, and many of you in the in the audience probably are aware that you know you you have certain procedures you use when you're on the job to protect yourself. And you know, and uh, as as my lab techs uh, scientists all know, you know, when they're in their when they're in their labs, they decon, they know how to do everything, but um, you know, to keep the space clean and and somewhat sterile. Uh, but uh, what we learned during this pandemic was we have to translate that out into our our public spaces into our lunchroom. We have to decon the tables. We have to, you know, make sure that they're the uh, surfaces the the uh, are all uh, protected. So that was one of the things that we kind of uh, had to shift and be aware of uh, for our employees uh, in moving forward. One of the other things that uh, we did from a from a staffing translating our, our our what we know into what we need to do was really helping our employees realize that. You know, as I mentioned before, we can't uh, uh, you can't do your work from home. You know, if you're if you're needing a Petri dish or something like that. Um, so you have to be here, uh, but helping the staff understand that when you're here, you're safe because you put all your PPE on and you in your decon, uh, but helping to understand that, you know, our role as a state public health lab or and, you know, this would be translate to many of the facilities uh, represented today would be uh, is that you're critical to the infrastructure. You're critical to moving things forward, to protecting lives, to helping people get through to the next step. And so what you do when you're off time is also critical. Uh, so trying to translate, especially to uh, younger folks who are used to having the freedoms to go uh, fel you know, fellowship and, and hang out together uh, at night and stuff, uh, that had to shift too. So we had to help understand that you have a purpose that's much bigger than just showing up at work and getting a paycheck you know your purpose is really helping protect the in our case the citizens citizens of kansas and so really emphasizing to the staff that it's it's critical that you pay attention to everything you do not just when you're here at work not just when you're even in the lunchroom but also when you go home at night you know don't you know stand a distance from the people at the grocery store you know don't go hang out at the you know i know you love going to friday nights at the you know the two for ones or whatever but don't go there you know <laughs> i need you to protect yourself because that helps all of us you know keep our our work going so and that that has been a critical plate piece we've had to rem remind ourselves of throughout the time but it's it applies to all of our works uh, of how to uh, translate what we do specifically for the pandemic into our regular lives and into the other work we do. That's great. That also really makes me think of in construction how each person has, you know, like a small portion, but really at the end of the day, you have this like larger goal and mission that you have to really r rally around to get the, the project complete. Um, Absolutely. Do you have some insights you'd like to share? Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, look, we, we looked at how how the researchers are safe, researchers and scientists are safe inside of a BSL-4 lab. You know, what, what procedures do they have or what design elements do they rely on uh, to, keep, uh, to keep them safe? So one thing that we did uh, this past summer is implemented a buddy system. This is very common. You know, you're in a BSL-4 with a buddy to make sure that you know, both of you are safe while you're in there working. So, so we did that. We implemented that uh, in, on our construction site. Make sure that you're socially distanced. Make sure that you're properly wearing your mask. Make sure you you are scanning that QR code to do your daily health screen. Really, just having a buddy. So, it took you know, kind of drawing a parallel to how how they operate versus you know, hey, that we can apply this to to our construction workers. To, so they maintain their their safety. Also, you know, with with the stress, uh, uh, men, mental health is obviously a big concern during this time. 
So just the stress uh, going through the pandemic, everyone reacts a little bit different. It's always good to have a friend or a buddy. So that was kind of a secondary benefit of just having that uh, person there. Um, another thing inside of uh, Biosafety Level 4 Lab, there's a lot of wayfinding, a lot of, you know, status monitors that show how negative uh, a room is in relationship to the atmosphere and a relationship to a, a different room, you know, door status lights. I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, that, 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 you know, give, give the researchers information and a sense of, of security that everything's okay. So we kind of took that 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 same kind of concept and apply, we added signage all over the place in our in our office as well as throughout the job site you know closing down this chair you know here's your ppe here's where you do your daily health screen just a lot of uh, signage that let everybody know you know the do's and don'ts you know during this new time so it was uh re really good to implement uh those uh, that wayfinding kind of stuff, and I, I think it helped everybody feel more confident in, in their work environment. That's great. Um, I think we can probably. Kate, do you have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you know, this is one of the questions I think the architects and engineers get asked most frequently: is just how do we design spaces? For future events like COVID. And, you know, we get that from office users, from schools, users of public spaces. And I think certainly space planning plays a role in this, but I think also many building owners struggle with the concept of designing for social distancing for the foreseeable future simply because of the investment in that amount of space, massive space requirements, and just so many unknowns. Um, actually, some of the most compelling solutions that I've heard for people keeping people safe and, uh, you know, actually relate to building systems. And um, it's something that my engineering counter counterparts, of course, are the experts in, um, but our, our firm, Clark and Arson, we did work with Johnson County in Kansas um, to conduct a COVID-wide um, safety analysis of a series of recommendations for their facilities countywide. And um, it was kind of interesting. Last year, ASHRAE um, created an, ep ec um, excuse me, an epidemic task force, which created a building readiness plan. And we utilize some of those um, aspects in our recommendations for our work with Johnson County. I mean, it spans everything from evaluation of current systems, potential for um, retro commissioning, um, the possibility for increased ventilation and, and whether or not existing systems have the capacity to do that, um, the pressurization of rooms. Um, we typically don't see that in an office environment or public spaces like libraries, but it is an option. Um, there's other things like replacement of filters, um, pre and post flushing strategies, um, and then, of course, the one that everybody talks about now is uh, UV radiation. So um, really, it's it's fairly costly, but it's, it's effective for killing airborne, airborne pathogens en route in, uh, in duct work. So I think that just in general, as Myron mentioned, you know, lab environments and healthcare environments, um, protocol and procedure are the keys to safety. And I think some of those some of those can be drawn into non lab environments too, where awareness of those around you following guidelines and being ready to act when something unexpected unexpected occurs. Um, those are really the keys to um, occupant safety. Thanks. So I think that actually really rolls well into our next question, which is uh, what advice do you have for other existing workplaces or new facilities currently being designed? And how do you balance current needs while remaining flexible for future unknowns? And then Seth, I'll let you kick this one off. Well, the, the, the first uh, question is easier to answer, so I'll start with that one. Uh, so my advice to clients is, you know, get, getting a design team, experienced design team and experienced builder on board at the very early planning stages. Get them together. They're going to start collaborating, sharing best practices, lessons learned will really yield the best result for for your facility you know if you can ha if you can integrate the facilities facility management team the users if it's you know healthcare or lab you know getting them involved in those discussions early on is critical but but again just experience collaboration and uh, you'll have you'll have a great outcome you know don't don't bring one of the one of the two on late in the game get them on board early uh, so the the flexibility, you know, is, is the more challenging question. But you know, obviously, your de your design has to meet the current or plan mission. So that's you know what what the design team and and the builder is is kind of focused on is what is the mission of of the of the facility. So you design around that. 
so b- being uh, flexible is where where it, it uh, is more of a challenge, right? It's hard to design for the unknown. We, we definitely, uh, you know, have more experience, right? I think all of us do of of needing our facilities to be flexible and pivot, you know, throughout 20. Uh, you know, we, we saw that firsthand. Um, you know, a lot of things that can get designed in is like, you know, easy stuff like mobile casework, you know, tables that aren't that aren't attached to the wall that can be easily moved around or, or re- reconfigured. You know, inside of a BSL 4 lab, we do a lot of concrete and CMU walls. We're actually uh, doing uh, more polymer walls now that can maintain the air pressure, but also allows for uh, future flexibility down the road. Um, we had numerous hospital clients across the country where we helped them respond to the pandemic by adding uh, testing trailers, triage screening areas, converting and, and even com- converting parking garages to hospital beds. So, you know, we were definitely a lot more versed in kind of this, you know, um, uh, just responding to the needs in the moment and going to be able to use that uh, in our, in our uh, design uh, uh, planning going forward. Kate, I know you kind of touched on some of the uh, planning for future unknowns, but. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to nerd out here for a second. Um, as, as an architect, when I'm drawing floor plans, one of the things I appreciate most about the design of laboratory and healthcare environments is that there's a lot of repetitive small spaces and or small, I would say, modular um, kind of units of space. And what that does is set up those types of facilities for great success when it comes to flexibility. Um, We like to call that modular design um, in the architect engineering world. And what that means for say lab spaces is that you would typically have a a center line of, let's say um, a peninsula of casework repeated across the length of the building at 11 foot on center or 10 foot five on center. And what that does is allow consistency and predictable spacing of um, infrastructure, of course, benches, whether fixed or mobile. Seth mentioned mobile casework huge flexibility there for not only um, you know the spacing of the casework or the size of it but also the use of what that um, what is happening on that lab bench um, you know varying the, the bench depth for equipment um, you can have shallower depth benches to get greater aisle widths if you have people sitting back to back deeper benches for you know potentially future unknown testing equipment when we worked with um, Myron and his team on the vision for the future KDHE facility um, I think we discussed with him the idea that, um, you know, designing, designating a space that could be designed for a surge event, um, swing space that aligns with the modularity of a typical lab, has some of that infrastructure in it that would then allow it to be utilized in, you know, an event such as COVID where you would need that for extra testing or in another type of building, maybe more research, unknown research, um, you know, in healthcare design. Um, again, they, there's um, a lot of opportunity for modularity there in the size of patient rooms, exam rooms. I think a few key takeaways there are, you know, designing um, a few negative pressure exam rooms because you just never know when you may want to have you know, the capacity for that. Um, you know, maximizing that on stage, off stage concept to really minimize the the um, kind of passing of patients um, with providers. And one interesting kind of tidbit we found was that um, there is a limit to the amount of hand sanitizer that can be contained within a smoke partition. So that kind of tells us that we may need to also think about codes differently um, in just designing for, you know, the amount of hand sanitizer that's needed now to keep people safe. I would say also limiting the amount of shared technology. Um, Those are all points at which people are touching the same um, piece of equipment over and over again. And, um, you know, sanitizing those is very, is very hard on that, on that technology, of course. And then again, it was mentioned the performance of ventilation systems. It's just such an increasingly important aspect of building design, whether that's in labs, healthcare environments, or just a general office building, for example. Great. And Myron, I know you touched on the need for flexibility at KDHE a little bit earlier, but do you want to expand on that? I'll add just a couple of points. First of all, I, I really appreciate what Seth said, and I would, would strongly add a, add a yes to that in that get your team together early you know don't don't wait bring in your construction guy after you've done all your architect work you know because uh it it really makes a difference and having a team that really knows knows labs or knows healthcare or knows office you know the where the two 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 halves of that work together um our work with clark anderson was uh so uh so helpful in that there was a an understanding of everything that's needed and one thing you know as uh kate mentioned we did plan for 
Uh, we said, OK, we know because we're a state lab. We know that we have to respond for emergencies. We need to have and we thought, well, you know, 15 percent is a pretty good number. That's a that's a pretty good number. One of the first things that that came up around March, May, June of last year was it's not big enough. <laughs> 15% is not anywhere close to being big enough. Um, well, maybe close, but it's not big enough. We're gonna. So when we get when we go to the next stage and we have to finish the design uh, uh, specs, it'll be more than 15% surge. So because um, you just never know. You do, you need to have that ability, and I think flexible casework is the key. You know, you can especially in uh, technology. Uh, industries, you know, your technology is changing all the time. So, you know, it's sometimes it's getting smaller, uh, sometimes it's getting bigger, and sometimes it's just all brand new. And so having the ability to bring in a new piece of equipment, you know, we've, we've added new pieces of equipment that we didn't even have before uh, here at the state lab. And uh, having a, the ability to have all your, uh, your power, your, your ventilation, everything can able to be connected in those spots along your flexible time is, is really critical. So, um, those flexibility is a key in, in all of these building and design components, I think. Great, thank you. Um, so last question, um, as we look back on this pandemic, um, I'm certain that from a learning perspective, we're going to have a lot of key takeaways, but uh, what takeaways have you identified already that will help our audience protect their workers, patients, visitors, or others during this and possibly future pandemics or crises? Well, I'll, I'll I'll just say it one more time. If I haven't said it enough, you got to be flexible <laughs> and the flexibility involves you know, staffing. It involves, you know, being flexible with your staff to help them mentally, as, as some of the things Seth pointed out, but also being flexible in, in your vendors and your, you know, uh, things like that. And collaborating with partners uh, is also a key, you know, being flexible in your collaboration. Um, and uh, making sure that you work closely with your vendors, with your partners, with your stakeholders to uh, accomplish the goal. That's that's one of the biggest things we've learned. Okay. You know, I think if the end goal, the primary end goal is to keep your workforce and patients, if in a healthcare environment, safe. And then that second goal would be to ensure that the work goes on, which is the key to solving the world issues we face now. I would say the biggest takeaway that I could recommend is investing early and often. Um, COVID caused so many people unawares. Um, you know, I think investing early in that additional space, um, you know, additional PPE, um, storage, flex space to accommodate unknown research or accommodate unknown treatment or exam needs. Um, Deferred maintenance, trying to make it not deferred and make it prioritize maintenance. Um, it, it can become a huge problem when a public health crisis hits like this has. Um, deferred maintenance then becomes a highly critical pain point um, for really any institution or facility. And then I think um, shifting our focuses as building occupants, as building owners, as designers from risk mitigation um, to resiliency. So a proactive approach to building design, uh, becoming comfortable and, and confident with uncertainty. And then doing that through smart, forward thinking architecture and engineering and construction. And Seth, any last uh, thoughts? Sure. Um, you know, probably at the top of the list is have and follow a health and safety plan and continue to refine or improve that as as new new stuff comes out or you learn new things you know just make sure it's not something that you put on the shelf you should constantly be uh, updating it you know as required uh, remain calm um, you know with managing a crisis it's important to you know, remain calm, surround yourself with smart people, work through the issue and develop the best course of action. Um, and then lastly, be, be empathetic to those that you interact with. People handle events like this extremely differently. Some, it really doesn't affect them at all and, and others it does. So just be empathetic that everyone's probably not like you, right? So their people are gonna be different. So just be empathetic uh, to that. Thanks. And I know I, I certainly didn't experience the pandemic through the same lens as you guys, but I know just looking back, the power of everyone working together and the ability to eliminate roadblocks that we thought were, you know, permanent. This is how it is and how it has to be. Um, the ability to change and innovate together to solve problems like this. And, you know, like looking back now, we have a vaccine like it's pretty incredible. So um, 
that's maybe my takeaway. But um, thank you all for sharing your insights today. And thank you to everyone who attended this program. Um, I believe that we have a few minutes left to respond to questions. Um, if your question is not answered, please reach out to me directly. It's L Connor, so L C O N N E R at McCarthy.com, and I will make sure that you receive a response. Thank you all for uh, attending. Bye.